The all-new Mazda 3 has caused waves for a few different reasons. First off, we have that very controversial styling out back. It's definitely round in the rear. Next, we have lost the independent rear suspension. Mazda tells us that the torsion beam axle in this vehicle has better handling characteristics than the previous generation version. So obviously we're gonna test that out in this video. And then we have the availability of all-wheel drive, which puts the Mazda 3 in a very unique category. Up until now, if you wanted a mainstream compact sedan or compact hatchback with all-wheel drive, you had very few options, most of them with the Subaru logo on them, but now we have a Mazda for that. And that puts the Mazda 3, especially in this hatchback form, in kind of an interesting category. You might want to be comparing this to something like a subcompact crossover in America, and that's exactly what we'll be doing in this video. Up front, we have a look that is definitely reminiscent of the rest of the Mazda lineup, but they tell us that this is the latest incarnation of their Kodo design language. That's what they're calling the overall theme that we see on every modern Mazda in America. The model that we're driving has black trim around the grille rather than chrome like we find in some of the other Mazda 3s out there, and then we have full LED headlamps in all models. Behind that Mazda logo, we also find a radar adaptive cruise control sensor. A hallmark of modern Mazda design is this long hood proportion. This is due as much to styling and the desire to make this look a little bit more like a rear wheel drive vehicle as it is a functional choice because the Mazda engine and exhaust manifold design requires a bit more room than most of the competition's engine designs. And that gives us this gorgeous look up front. But this is the hatchback, not the sedan version of the Mazda 3. And this is my least favorite, I have to say. I love, 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 love the way the sedan looks but the hatchback is just a little bit peculiar to my eye, and it all has to do with what's going on right back here. We have this large C-pillar right back here, which reduces rearward visibility, and then we have this extremely raked rear hatch, which reduces cargo practicality. Mazda tells us that the hatch and the sedan share a lot up front, but as we go towards the rear, less and less is shared, and then by the time we get to these rear doors, nothing is shared with the Mazda 3 sedan at all. That's part of why this is a significant eight inches shorter than the sedan. This slots right in between the Mazda CX-3 and the Mazda 3 sedan in terms of overall length at 175.6 inches long. This is about five inches longer than a Honda HRV, but we get relatively similar interior room. Be sure and let me know what you think about the overall design of the Mazda 3 down there in the comment section below, especially if you really like the hatchback or if you really like the sedan more than the other. Out back, we have full LED tail lamp modules, which is a nice premium touch that we don't find in most entries in this segment. Most of the competition use combination lamps where one of these modules or more would be an incandescent bulb. We have a subtle all-wheel drive badge right there and then dual exhaust tips at the bottom of the bumper. From this angle, you can really see that not only is the Mazda 3 rounded in side profile, it's also rounded from this direction as well. We have that really strong hip look right there, and then it tapers in quite a bit towards the roof line. Even though the Mazda 3 hatch now offers all-wheel drive, they're not positioning this as an off-road hatch. If you want the off-road Mazda, that's theoretically the CX-3 or the CX-5. But we don't really find that much less ground clearance in the Mazda 3 hatch versus the CX-3. Only about 7 tenths of an inch difference. That puts this right in line with the CX-3 and the Nero, and only 1 inch below the Hyundai Kona. 5.5 inches of ground clearance is a little bit above the average compact hatchback or compact sedan, but definitely below the average compact crossover. Winter traction is the big reason that we find all-wheel drive on this hatchback. And even with five and a half inches of ground clearance, you'll be just fine in most urban and suburban areas. As you'd expect out of a new car design, we get all of Mazda's latest active safety technologies on the Mazda 3. And all of them are standard on the hatchback. That's a little bit different than the sedan. That's because the hatchback starts one trim level above the base version of the sedan in America. That gives us adaptive cruise control with pedestrian detection, autonomous braking, and blind spot monitoring. That puts this on relatively equal footing with the Corolla hatchback, the Civic hatchback, and a little bit ahead of the average subcompact crossover in America that you might want to be cross-shopping this with. For 2019, there is just one engine available in America. It's a 2.5 liter four-cylinder direct injection engine. It produces 186 horsepower and 186 pound-feet of torque. It sends power to the ground via your choice of a six-speed automatic or a six-speed manual transmission and available all-wheel drive. Unfortunately for manual transmission lovers, all-wheel drive and the manual transmission are not available together, and the manual transmission is not available in the lower end trims of the hatch. Mazda is considering that a more premium option. According to Mazda, the combined fuel economy estimate for the Mazda 3 all-wheel drive hatch is 27 miles per gallon. That's pretty in line with some of the subcompact all-wheel drive crossovers out there, but definitely below some of the high-efficiency compact stands that you might want to compare this to, like the Jetta or the Civic with the 1.5-liter turbo. 
If you want better fuel economy in your Mazda, hope is likely on the horizon because Mazda has indicated that their new Skyactiv X engine will find its way into the Mazda 3 at some point soon. We just don't know whether that's going to happen for 2020 or not. Skyactiv X is Mazda's direct injection compression ignition gasoline engine. If you want to know more about that, we have a complete video on our channel. There'll be a link right up there at the top of the screen to take you on over to that one. In a nutshell, that engine operates on what could be considered a diesel cycle for ignition. It promises diesel-like fuel efficiency on regular unleaded gasoline. Power figures are likely going to come in right around the same as this two and a half liter four-cylinder engine here. At this point in time, we don't know what models or trims that engine will be available in, but it is going to be shipping in Europe very soon in the new Mazda CX-30. I'm going to give the front seats 9 out of 10 points overall. We have a power driver seat with a two-way adjustable lumbar support and a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. It's worth noting that the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat, and that's part of why I'm going to cut one point out of the score. The rest of the interior in the Mazda 3 definitely punches above its weight in terms of overall luxury feel and fit and finish quality, so I do wish we had the option of things like a four-way adjustable lumbar support for the driver and an adjustable lumbar support for the passenger as well. Hopping into the back seat, we find that things are a little bit tight in the Mazda 3. We get a little bit less combined legroom in here than we do in some of the larger compact sedans and compact hatchbacks. This is very similar to the Elantra and about five inches more generous than what we see in the Toyota Corolla, but there are a number of compact sedans and compact hatches that will definitely give you more legroom than this. With the front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, you can see that I have about half an inch of legroom left. In terms of overall headroom, the hatch is not as generous as some hatches in this category either. If I try and lean my head back, it does touch the ceiling. I have to crane it to one side in order to put my head against that rear headrest back there. That's part of the reason that I think a subcompact crossover comparison is definitely appropriate with the Mazda 3 hatchback, because we get a little bit more room back here, but not too much more than a Kix, a Nero, a Kona, Mazda CX-3, etc. Versus those subcompact comparisons, we do get a little bit more width, and that means that an adult may be a little bit more comfortable in the middle seat in terms of overall width in the rear, but you can see that headroom is definitely limited back here. And if I try and move all the way over to the right side, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I had a six foot five person sit there. You can see I really cannot sit behind that. There's really just no way to get my other leg into that footwell. The rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion, and I can just barely fold them down with that front seat adjusted for me. Because of the overall rear end design, cargo capacity comes in lower than you might think, at 20.1 cubic feet. That's definitely an improvement over the sedan, but considerably less than we find in something like the Civic hatchback or the Hyundai Ioniq hatchback. When the hatch is open, you'll really notice that the opening tapers considerably up towards the top, and that's because that overall body style tapering in sort of like a pyramid, as I mentioned earlier. In terms of overall comparisons, this is very similar to some of the subcompact crossovers you might want to compare this with, and actually quite similar to the Subaru compact hatchback as well. But that said, you'll notice that there are some subcompact crossovers like a Honda HRV that definitely has a larger cargo area and a square and more practical cargo area as well. You can really see that drastic angle right back here for the hatch. Even though we have been driving the top end trim and keep that in mind as we're looking around, overall the Mazda 3 definitely feels more premium than its mainstream competition like the Civic or the Corolla. Overall parts quality and interior refinement is a little bit above something like an Acura ILX or a base model Buick, but not quite in the same category as the average German luxury car. We have two-way headrests up front, height adjustable shoulder belts, and our model has leather upholstery. The premium feel inside this cabin is really obvious when we take a look at the rear doors, for instance. Very unusually in the compact mainstream segment, we have materials in the back that match what we see up front. So we have all soft touch materials in the upper section of the doors, this stitched component right there in the middle, the chrome handle for the door release, and then soft touch plastics below. Definitely more premium materials than we find in the Corolla or in the Civic. Moving from the doors on over to the dashboard, that premium combination of materials continues. And then we have this strong two-tiered design theme where we have the infotainment system up there at the top and then the controls for the infotainment system below. As with the doors, we have a lot of premium materials going on. This red section is a stitched component. We then have a soft touch upper section of the dashboard and then hard plastics below. On the passenger side, we have two air vents and then an air vent blank right in the middle to help tie the theme together. Below that, we have a slot style glove compartment. I was barely able to fit a 10 inch iPad inside. Some of the smaller ones would definitely fit. In the center of the dashboard, we find Mazda's newest infotainment system. This has a unique screen and unique software compared with every other Mazda on sale right now. As you can see, the system offers smartphone integration, but very different than the previous generation of Mazda systems, this is no longer a touchscreen. It's also placed a little bit higher and a little bit further away from the driver. 
The software design is a little bit different as well as you can see right here. It's definitely snappier than the previous generation. That was a common complaint with the Mazda infotainment software is that it was very slow. That's not what we see in this generation of the Mazda software, whether we're zooming in and out on the navigation system or whether we're interacting with the vehicle settings that are adjusted via this screen. This is definitely snappier than the last generation model. Below the infotainment screen, we find the controls for the two-zone automatic climate control system. This is also where we find the controls for the heated front seats and the engine start-stop button. Below the infotainment system, we have a single USB input, a storage area where you can keep your knickknacks or smartphones, and then we have two cup holders right there behind that door. The shifter is a pretty traditional console design. Drive is all the way back there. Manual mode is over to the left and we pull towards the driver for gear up. There's a toggle for the drive mode right here that enables and disables the sport mode. There's just that one drive mode. We have an electric parking brake and auto brake hold right there behind it. Then we find the controller for that infotainment system. Thematically, this controller is very similar to BMW's iDrive controller. We have a knob right there in the middle. It rotates around, toggles side to side, up, down, clicks down to enter. We then have some direct access buttons around it. This takes us to navigation, the media interface, the home button takes us to the Apple CarPlay interface or the Mazda interface if we press and hold it. Since I have an iPhone connected, we then have a back button right over there and a favorite button over to the right. We then have a power and volume knob over here that toggles side to side like Audi MMI to go track forward and backward. The center armrest is softly padded and it slides forward and backward and then opens right like that. In here we find a single USB input, a fairly shallow storage area. There's a, an SD card slot right there for the navigation database and a 12 volt power port. This instrument cluster is a partial LCD unit, similar but not identical to what we see in the Mazda 6. There's a physical tachometer on the left and physical engine temperature and fuel gauge over here on the right. Everything else is being delivered by that LCD right there in the middle. It has a very consistent look, so it doesn't change themes, for instance, when we engage or disengage sport mode. In addition to giving us trip computer information, we can also get active safety system information and a different look to the speedometer, or we can turn it off. That's really all the variation that we see in this display. In addition to that instrument cluster, we also have a heads-up display that is very similar to what we see in the CX-9. The steering wheel is a round design with three spokes. There's a little bit of a split to that bottom spoke. We have paddle shifters on the back that are a little bit difficult to see, but we have up on the right and then down over there on the left. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the Raider Adaptive Cruise Control System. And on the left side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the infotainment system, along with an info button that changes the display on that multifunction LCD cluster. Mazda's decision to make the 2.5 liter engine standard in the 3 for 2019 means that we get more standard power than most of the competition at 186 horsepower. But that doesn't necessarily translate into class leading acceleration. This all wheel drive model went from 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds. Now we were able to get our hands on a dealer provided front wheel drive sedan that went 0 to 60 in 7.1 seconds. That difference really surprised me because the all-wheel drive system isn't terribly heavy, so I wasn't expecting a 7 tenths difference between the all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive models. In terms of comparisons, you will definitely get faster 0 to 60 in something like a Honda Civic with the 1.5 liter turbo. Now that engine is not standard, but you will find it in models that are competing with this in terms of overall price tag. The two likely reasons that this is not as fast as a Civic are that this is not a turbocharged engine, so it doesn't have that aggressive low end torque. The CVT in the Honda Civic is also definitely an asset when it comes to acceleration, and this model has a six speed automatic, not an eight speed automatic like we find in some of the newer entries. The lack of gears means that these ratios are a little bit further apart than the competitions, and we don't have as aggressive a starting ratio, which really would help improve overall 0 to 60 acceleration. Mazda tells us that they prefer a six-speed automatic transmission because it's more engaging. It also happens to be the transmission that they have on hand. They're not buying anybody's transmission. They're making this one themselves. I'm a little bit torn about the transmission personally because we definitely have fewer ratios for the transmission to hunt through, so it definitely feels a little bit more engaging than the eight-speed automatic that we find in the Jetta, but I suspect that if Mazda broke down and bought someone's eight-speed automatic and put it under this hood, it would likely get better fuel economy and better acceleration as well. In our braking tests, this model took 116 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's likely due to the somewhat narrower tires we find on the Mazda 3 versus the competition. This starts out with 205 width tires, goes up to 215 tires in the model that we're driving right here. And some of the competitive options out there will have 235 width tires. They'll be notably wider than what we see in the Mazda 3. But as always with Mazda, they march to a slightly different drummer, and they've proved that with an excellent suspension design, we can have handling that is just about as good as the competition's models with their wider tires. For instance, out on the road, this really does compete incredibly well with the Honda Civic in terms of overall handling ability, even though the Civic has those wider tires on it. 
Wins for the Mazda 3 are definitely the steering feel and the eagerness with which this attacks the corners. The Honda Civic, on the other hand, feels a little bit more Germanic. It feels a little bit larger, a little bit heavier, but it definitely has the grip. I have to say that I would love to see what this car would be like out on the road with wider tires, say 235 with grippy summer tires. This would handle just about as well as anything in the luxury segment, I suspect. Something along the lines of the Mercedes CLA or an Audi A3. It should really tell you something, that we can make an honest comparison between this and an Audi A3 out on the road, and that's just not something we could do with a Hyundai Elantra or a Toyota Corolla. Out on a rougher road like the gravel road that we're on here, the suspension is still very well composed, even though we don't have that independent suspension in the rear anymore. That did surprise me a little bit because a lot of the competitive non-independent suspensions in this category do get more upset over broken pavement. Now when you really start pushing the Mazda 3 on rougher pavement, I do think that the rear end is not quite as composed as the current generation Honda Civic, but it's very, very close. Why did Mazda move from an independent suspension to the design we see back there? Well, the two most likely reasons have to do with overall packaging efficiency. It may have improved the overall cargo capacity in the rear. It may also have been a little bit easier to integrate the all-wheel drive system in the way that they did. And then obviously cost is a big factor as well. It's likely that this suspension is a little bit less expensive to build over time than an independent suspension. Back out on the paved road, the suspension definitely soaks up large and small imperfections very well. I'm going to give this a B plus when it comes to the overall ride quality. I think Mazda has done an excellent job balancing handling ability and overall ride quality. So if you want to take your compact vehicle out on a long road trip, this is definitely going to do it very well. Versus some of the subcompact crossovers in America, this is definitely going to be the road holding and the road trip champion. The longer wheelbase we see in this versus many of those subcompact crossovers means that we don't have that same sort of bobblehead feel that we find in something like a Kona or an Echo Sport or even Mazda's own CX-3. And the suspension is definitely a little bit more compliant than some of those options as well, making it more comfortable for those longer highway journeys. And yet we have much better handling than we find in the subcompact crossover category. The lower ground clearance, having everything closer to the ground, means that this definitely carves a corner much better than even the Mazda CX-3. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we measured 70 and a half decibels, which is definitely quieter than the average for the compact category and significantly quieter than the average for the subcompact crossover category. Now, as we've seen in other Mazda models lately, we do get a bit more tire noise into the cabin. Remember that there are two components to cabin noise, wind noise and tire noise. Wind noise is well controlled, but we do get a little bit more tire noise in here. When it comes to fuel economy, I'm going to give this model an A. We've been averaging just over 27 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. Some people may question that particular score because you will get about 10 miles per gallon better in a Jetta or a Honda Civic with their turbocharged engines. But it's important to remember that neither the Jetta nor the Civic are all-wheel drive. So if you were to compare this to all-wheel drive options out there in the crossover segment, you're definitely going to be getting better fuel economy on average in this model. Also keep in mind, we've been driving this pretty aggressively over this week, so I suspect if you were driving it more gently, you'd likely be getting 28 or 29 miles per gallon. Mazda tells us that this all-wheel drive system is designed a little bit differently than the one in the Mazda CX-5. It's designed to disconnect the rear axle at highway speeds to help improve overall fuel economy. And this operates as more of a reactive all-wheel drive system than a predictive all-wheel drive system, again, in order to help improve overall efficiency. Now, in terms of all-wheel drive performance, you will notice the difference between this and the CX-5, because if the going gets slippery, you'll notice that the front wheels will slip a little bit and then the rear wheels will engage. But it doesn't cause a functional problem with this all-wheel drive system. It is still very, very sure-footed in slippery conditions. And if you want to drive your Mazda 3 out on the road, there is definitely a little bit of a difference between this and the front-wheel drive model in terms of overall grip. The all-wheel drive system definitely helps the driving dynamics, but not as much as you might think. We don't have access to a skid pad, but publications that do have indicated that the improvement over the front-wheel drive model is pretty minor, but it does improve the overall feel. Bottom lining the Mazda is pretty easy. This has a very premium feel to it, from the way that this vehicle handles, to the way that it rides, to the way that the interior is put together, and just the overall feeling that it exudes. This is exactly the kind of vehicle that near luxury brands should be building, especially brands like Acura. In fact, I suspect that if you pulled this Mazda logo off the steering wheel, put an Acura logo on it, and you put the average Acura shopper in the car to drive it around, they would think that this is the next premium Acura. And I would argue that if you did that, you would end up with a more premium product than Acura currently has in this segment. This definitely has a more premium feel to it than the current generation Acura ILX.
With a base price of $23,600, the hatchback is more expensive than the sedan. It starts $2,600 more than the base sedan and $1,000 more versus the comparably equipped sedan. The important thing to remember is that the hatch does not come in the same absolute base trim that we find the sedan in. We do have more features standard in the hatchback. If you want all-wheel drive on your Mazda 3, it is available on all trims of the hatchback, so you don't have to step up to the premium trims if you don't want to. Now the model we were driving this week started at $28,900 because it was the top end trim. In terms of overall price tag, oddly enough, the Mazda 3 hatchback is not that far off of a compact crossover. For instance, a Mazda CX-5 with all-wheel drive is only about $750 more than the base all-wheel drive Mazda 3 hatch. But arguably, the Mazda 3 is better equipped than that base CX-5. It's equipped more like the two-ring all-wheel drive model, which has a base price of $28,015. So overall, Mazda 3 hatchback value is pretty good. In fact, it's quite similar to the CX-3 two-ring with all-wheel drive. That model with adaptive cruise control will be about $740 more expensive than the Mazda 3 hatch all-wheel drive. The main reason for that price difference is that crossovers are quite simply big business in America. They're very popular, so they tend to go at a premium versus sedans and traditional hatchbacks. That's also the reason that there's really no true competitor to the Mazda 3 hatch outside of Subaru. Our first competitor here is the 2019 Subaru Impreza. It is the only compact sedan and compact hatchback in America outside the luxury segment that has all-wheel drive. The five-door version of the Impreza will start significantly less expensive than the all-wheel drive Mazda 3, however, at $19,095. That's about a $6,000 delta. Admittedly, the Impreza has less standard equipment. It also doesn't have a standard automatic transmission, but if you want all-wheel drive and a stick, it's going to be the only option here. Adding the equipment to the Impreza that we find standard on the Mazda 3 hatch will get you up to about $23,490, still notably less expensive than the Mazda. But the interior doesn't feel quite as premium and it doesn't feel as fresh as the Mazda. Although depending on your particular sense of style, some might find the Impreza a little bit more attractive than the overall rear end styling that we find in the Mazda 3. Oddly enough, the Mazda 3 and the Impreza hatchback are right about the same size, and they have very similar cargo room as well, but we do get a little bit more headroom in the Subaru. The Mazda has a little bit more ground clearance, which is a little bit surprising. For most folks out there, ground clearance is not going to be a big differentiator between the Subaru and the Mazda because we're talking about a very small difference. But if you really wanted the next level in ground clearance, then there is a Subaru for that. You could get the Subaru Crosstrek. It's an Impreza hatchback that's been additionally lifted up to about 8.7 inches. Adding all-wheel drive makes for strange bedfellows, so let's talk about the Subaru Forester now. It's a compact crossover, obviously not a compact hatchback, but it has a very similar base price for all-wheel drive, $24,295, making it a little bit less expensive expensive than the Mazda 3 hatch. The main reason I'm including the Forester here is that versus the Impreza, the Forester has a more premium feeling interior and it has a little bit more standard feature content as well. So in some ways it could be considered the better corollary to the Mazda 3. Big differences between the Forester and the Mazda 3 obviously are going to be that one is a hatchback, the other one is a crossover, so handling is going to be better in the Mazda 3 overall. Road dynamics are going to be better, but we're going to get more ground clearance in the Forester. Overall, the Forester is a pretty good deal, and if you're looking for something with more cargo capacity, that's definitely where the Forester excels. But if you're looking for something that has the sexy design that we see in the Mazda 3 and better overall road handling and fuel economy characteristics, that could be the Mazda 3, depending on exactly where you're driving. It is worth noting the Forester is very, very efficient, and the Mazda 3 falls behind overall efficiency a little bit. I suppose you could also compare the Mazda 3 to something like a Honda HRV. In EX trim with all-wheel drive, you're going to get a relatively similar feature set, and it's going to cost about the same about $25,200 for the Honda. The HRV has a pretty competitive interior for the subcompact category, but when compared against the Mazda 3 and the average compact sedan in America, it definitely feels a little bit less premium. The HRV is also going to be significantly slower. Even though I wasn't too impressed with the overall acceleration figures in the Mazda 3 hatch, the Honda HRV has less power, it has a much smaller engine, the CVT doesn't necessarily help things out too much there, and overall acceleration times are definitely on the long side. In terms of overall practicality, the HRV fares very well. It has a very practical cargo area, and we have a great deal of interior legroom as well. But again, the interior doesn't feel quite as fresh, and overall performance feels a little bit more sluggish than in the Mazda 3 hatch, even though we weren't too impressed with the overall acceleration times in the Mazda. Other than these options, if you want something that feels about as premium as the interior in a Mazda, then you will have to step up to something like perhaps a Mini Clubman. 
Although still a subcompact vehicle, the Mini's kind of an interesting option here because it has an interior that I think feels just about as premium as the Mazda 3, although it is worth noting that in some areas I think the Mazda excels over the Mini. It also has the availability of all-wheel drive even with the less powerful engines in their lineup. Now if you want more powerful engines, Mini will of course sell those to you, but they're going to get pretty expensive, and that really is the thing all the way around about the Mini brand. Even though we have a relatively low MSRP in the Clubman, it does get pretty expensive if you get carried away with options, and boy are there a lot of options available on the Mini. And that's just factory options. If we talk about dealer options or dealer available accessories, there are tons and tons of ways that you can configure your Mini. And that really is a strong Mini selling point, the ability to customize your ride. Mini also likes to position themselves as a luxury car alternative, so the overall brand experience is definitely going to be a little bit more premium than what we see in the Mazda, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the car will feel overall more premium than the Mazda. If you're shopping for an all-wheel drive vehicle and you don't live in a rural area where you really need to tackle deep snow drifts or uh, tougher off-road situations, deep ruts, that sort of thing, the Mazda 3 hatch and the Mazda 3 sedan with all-wheel drive are definitely going to give you more than enough traction and more than enough clearance for most situations. You'll find a more premium interior and improved driving dynamics versus anything in the compact crossover segment at a lower price, and again, a better interior and better handling dynamics at a similar price to the average subcompact crossover in America. So if you're looking to break out of the compact or subcompact crossover boxes, definitely put the Mazda 3 on your shopping list. But if you're me, take a look at the sedan rather than the hatchback. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below, especially how do you feel about the hatchback styling in the Mazda 3? Would you get the hatchback or would you get the sedan? If you haven't already done so, find us over at facebook.com slash so you can see what we're driving this week, and I'll see you later.